A seizure is when the brain has an episode of abnormal or excessive electrical activity. A classic seizure basically happens when an animal often is at rest. So often they'll wake the owner up in the middle of the night. You can have some uh, paw paddling, jaw chomping, a lot of excessive salivation or frothing at the mouth. If the bladder is full, you'll have urination. And when they urinate, it's a very dynamic, very strenuous uh, episode. And so it'll be a pulsatile, very squirt, 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 squirt type of activity with the urination. So that's what a classic seizure looks like. They tend to last anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute to two minutes. Following the seizure, the animal can be blind. And so sometimes they aren't sure who the owner is. Sometimes they can be clingy, hungry, scared, um, aggressive. So when the animal has a seizure, falling words, you have to be a little careful on how you approach them because they may not know who you are. When it's not classic, it gets really important to be very detailed on what you're seeing at that time. So what is the animal doing beforehand? Are they up, excited, running? Are they on the couch just relaxing? Are they asleep? Are they stiff? Is there paddling? Was there uh, urination? If there was urination, was it the squirt or did it just kind of fall out of the animal? So other episodes that can look like seizures can be cardiovascular events or sometimes some vertigo type of events. So when it's not classic, it's really important to get really great details on what they look like so we can kind of try to differentiate what that episode your animal had was. We don't want to go down a workup for seizure if the animal actually had a heart problem. So detailed uh, descriptions of what you're seeing at home is very helpful for us to determine whether the animal actually had a seizure or not. There's different causes of seizures and so often clients will come in wondering if this, that or the other thing caused the seizure. I always try to say, keep it simple. There's three categories of things we consider when animals have seizures. There's idiopathic epilepsy, so your animal's having a seizure for unknown reason. So this is a problem at a functional level, neurotransmitter level in the brain. So any test I run is gonna be negative. And so that sometimes can be a little frustrating not to have a specific diagnostic test, but it's a process of elimination. Other causes of seizures can be metabolic causes, and I think of that as everything from the neck down. So that's going to be looking at um, liver function, glucose levels, um, other systemic illnesses that the animal may have. The last category is going to be structural brain disease, so I think of that as what's going on upstairs. Is there a problem in the brain? Things that can happen in the brain can be anything from a congenital malformation, which means that your animal was born with something not normal to something that's happened as the animal um, you know, is aged. So anything from a stroke to a tumor to an inflammatory process that's known as encephalitis. The way we evaluate for structural causes is we look at looking at the brain. So we do a brain scan, which is called an MRI, and that allows us to look at the brain like our eyes would look at a brain. So it's almost like having the brain on a platter and looking at it with our eyeballs. It's not a microscope. So if there's something a millimeter or bigger abnormal in the brain, we're going to see that with an MR scan. Sometimes on the MR scan, we also, following the scan, we'll also do a spinal tap, which is collecting some of the fluid that bathes the surface of the brain. And that allows us to look at white cell count, protein levels. We know what normal is, so we're really just looking, is there any abnormal findings in there? The answer to that question varies a little bit based on the situation in front of us. So if you have a young pet that's had one seizure, the first part is starting with a basic physical exam. If the examination is normal, then we may discuss starting with some basic blood work to make sure that liver, kidneys, electrolytes, glucose are all normal. If that comes back within normal limits, the next discussion would be should we consider doing an MRI. The MRI is going to allow you to evaluate the structural aspect of the brain to see if there's any abnormalities. If the animal is an epileptic, the scan is going to be normal. With epilepsy, no two epileptics are alike. So it gets a little hard to let owners know what to expect down the road. So we have some epileptics that may have one or two seizures a year and never need medications. We have other epileptics that are very severe epileptics and despite being on multiple medications have cluster seizures that go on for two to three days every week to two. With epilepsy, the big thing is that in between seizures, the dog returns to their normal self. So 
If your dog has seizures, but following the seizures, once the recovery, it's back to your normal pet, then over time, we're gonna be able to make a determination that the animal's epileptic, just in the fact that if we're six months, a year into it, and the dog's still having seizures, but is normal in between those seizures, chances are it's an epileptic. Seizures can get harder to control. You can see pacing, circling, aggression, standing in corners, just change in behavior of the animal. Blindness, dragging of the limbs, so other neurological abnormalities besides seizures. So if the owner does want to proceed on with an MRI, information is powerful. So even when the information comes back and it's normal, it's very helpful going forward to know that we've done the scan and in future times when the animal has seizures, we've known that the scan is normal and that the animal's epileptic. So we don't keep coming back to wondering, are we missing something? If there's an abnormality noted during the exam, the concern is that there is a structural brain lesion causing the abnormality we're seeing and likely explaining the seizures that you're seeing at home. The MR scan is going to let us evaluate for congenital malformations, tumors, encephalitis, potential stroke. In general, if you have more than one seizure per three months on a consistent basis, it's time to start an anticonvulsant. The goal of the anticonvulsant is not necessarily that your animal will never have another seizure. The goal is to try to make the seizure frequency better than what it currently is. That's relative. So some animals that have seizures once a month, if we can get that to once every six or eight weeks, that's better. If we have animals that have seizures once a week, if we can push that to two weeks or three weeks, that's better. Sometimes we're able to do that with one medication. Sometimes you need a combination of medications. The eventual goal is as good of seizure control as we can get with minimizing some of the side effects of the medications. There's four cornerstone drugs that we choose for maintenance medications. There's potassium bromide, phenobarbital, zanismide, and Keppra. Which drug we pick for your animal is gonna depend, again, on who's in front of us. Each of the drugs have their pros and cons. So Keppra, in general, tends to be the safest medication that we have with really minimal side effects. Few animals have a little bit of sedation. If you see that, it tends to go away after about 10 to 14 days. It's well tolerated in the animals. There's no liver side effects, kidney side effects. We do not need to monitor blood work. We do not need to monitor levels. The negative part about Keppra is even though it's very safe, it's often not the most effective anticonvulsant. I will pick that drug if I have a young dog who's just starting seizures, enough to consider a medication, but we can start easy. Often I'll tell these owners that we'll start with the Keppra, see how things go. Depending on the seizure frequency, if the Keppra has not improved that, sometimes we bump the dose a few times, but often I'll have to add on another medication. But it's always a reasonable one to start with and see how it goes, because if it works for the animal, it's a very safe medication, and then we only need to see your animal back once a year to refill the prescription. The second medication that we can talk about is phenobarbital. So phenobarbital is a very reliable anticonvulsant, and to be honest with you, is one of my favorite. Phenobarbital is a drug that has some fine print, and so it is one that we do have to monitor. It is metabolized through the liver, so on animals that we're going to choose to start phenobarbital, we want to have some blood work first to make sure that the liver values are normal before we start. With that medication, after the animal's been on the phenobarbital for you know, a month or so, we'll go ahead and recheck to make sure the animal's tolerating the medication uh, with the liver. We also monitor phenobarb levels, and we want to keep the level below 35. And the reason being is that animals that are on phenobarbital with phenobarb serum levels greater than 35 long term are more apt to have liver issues down the road. Now the nice thing with the liver is he's pretty forgiving, and so when you monitor liver values, you keep your eye on the animal. If you make sure that phenobarb level is less than 35, you're keeping an eye on the liver values. If there's any changes that are starting to happen, you catch them early enough that hopefully it's not gonna be a problem with your animal. So with phenobarbital, we do monitor those levels after you start the medication, and then at least every six months um, after being on the medication.
It takes about two weeks for the drug to build up into steady state. So when we first start the medication, the, the animal can be a little drunk, lethargic, tired for the first 10 to 14 days. I usually ask clients to cut me a little bit of slack, give me two weeks. Most of the time, as advertised, come two to three weeks, some of those uh, excessive side effects you see in the beginning have subsided. There are some animals that are very sensitive to it. If the sedation is still present three weeks later, we'll go ahead and, and adjust the medication for you. Sometimes when animals come in, if they're having severe seizures, we don't always have the luxury of waiting for two weeks uh, for that phenobarbital to build up in the system. So often we will load them with the phenobarbital. And what that means is that we're gonna give a very high dose over 24 hours, and the goal of that is to try to get effective um, therapeutic levels into the system faster than having to wait the two weeks. When we do load your pet on phenobarbital, you're gonna see some sedative side effects. It's just part of the medication, but again, it's transient. It will get better over the next 10 to 14 days. The next medication we can consider is zanisamide. Zanisamide is a drug that's fairly safe. Uh, we have used it a lot. In some animals, rarely, in the first couple of weeks of using it, some animals can have a liver reaction to it that can be pretty severe. It's extremely rare. With zanisamide long-term, it's a drug that we also do need to monitor liver values because in some cases it can affect some of the liver values. So it is a drug that will require um, lab work probably every six to 12 months. Side effects of zanisamide, some animals can have a little inappetence, um, but for the most part, it's non-sedating and very well tolerated. So potassium bromide is a very effective anticonvulsant. There's pros and cons to this medication as well. So the pro is it's, it's fairly safe. It does not hurt the liver, the kidneys. Um, however, it can make dogs hungry. And so dogs that get hungry sometimes eat too much. So often clients will tell me the drug made their dog fat, and I'll remind them that the drug made the dog hungry, and the food that they fed the dog made the dog fat. So you have to be a little cautious with which pet I choose to uh, recommend potassium bromide. So if I have a 12-year-old couch potato golden retriever, that might not be the best uh, option for him. If I have a two-year-old Vizsla, no problem. So um, increase appetite. The other can be uh, sedation. So this drug is more associated with hind end uh, sedation, lethargy, ataxia in the back end, or drunkenness in the back end. Every dog is different, so we can always try it. And if we feel that your dog has excessive side effects, it's a very easy drug to alter um, and adjust the, the dose. This drug has a very long half-life. And what that means is if we start a maintenance dose today, it's gonna take about nine weeks for that drug to slowly creep up into the system. To help us faster than that nine weeks, we will often load the dog on this medication. Loading is giving a very high dose, over one to two to three days, and again, the goal is to try to get some therapeutic effect of that drug into the system faster than waiting for the nine weeks uh, of steady state. When we load your animal on potassium bromide, they are gonna be drunk, um, but again, it's transient, and over time, that will improve. If you call a hospital, a basic rule of thumb, which is safe, is if you have three seizures within 12 to 24 hours, your animal sh should probably be brought into the emergency room. I'll often tell clients that what alarms you and brings you to the ER room when you first start living with a dog with seizures is gonna be very different than after you've been experienced and have been living with the situation for a couple of years. So if you feel out of control, if you have to leave the house, if you have no emergency drugs, if your dog does not seem to be recovering from the seizure, you should bring your animal into the ER room. If you're home for the day, you have your emergency kits, your animal's recovering well and is really responsive to you in between seizures, it's your comfort level. I often get the question, will my animal die from having a seizure? The reality is most seizures are short, two to three minutes, and with or without you, your animal's going to recover from the seizure. The seizures become life-threatening if they go into a seizure and don't come out, or they start having seizures back-to-back, -back, rapid fire, and that turns into one big long seizure. That's called status epilepticus, and that is life-threatening. Status epilepticus is rare, but it can happen. This is why all of our animals are sent home with an emergency kit to have on hand in case of that unfortunate event. 
In some situations, despite multiple different anticonvulsants, some animals continue to experience severe seizures on a very regular basis. This unfortunately can lead some owners to have to make some very challenging decisions on quality of life for the animal and for their family. So in some cases, seizures can lead to considerations of euthanasia. If we determine that your animal has epilepsy, what I often tell clients is that your animal's epilepsy is your animal's epilepsy. So I've never seen two epileptics that are the same. And it's a journey, and it's a journey that can change. So we basically start at the beginning, and we often have to be fluid or go with the flow or make alterations based on what's happening at home. Sometimes when you just think you have things under control, things can change. So it is a lifelong relationship with your veterinarian or your veterinary neurologist um, for ongoing seizure medications. There are many animals that can live a long, happy life with seizures and on anticonvulsant medications. If you miss a dose of medication for your animal, it's always safest just to go ahead and give another dose when you remember. Some owners ask me if it's safe to leave their animals home alone. The reality of it is, is that seizures happen at any point in time. They're predictably unpredictable. We don't know when they're gonna happen. So could your dog or cat have a seizure when you're not at home? That's entirely possible. I think you have to make a decision on whether you're comfortable taking that risk. And most of us, to be honest with you, have to go to the grocery store, have to live our life. We're doing the best we can by our pets. If seizures happen, most of the time they're self-limiting. You may not know your animal had a seizure, or you may come home and find evidence of a seizure, like drool on the floor or some urine. That is out of character for your animal. Is there a possibility that you come home and find that your animal has passed from a seizure? It's possible, it's not common, but it can happen. If the risk of that is too great for you to consider, then you may wanna think of having either a pet sitter or the animals with a family member or friend when you need to leave the house.